And uh, Professor Melanie Tetro Friend, uh, so she started her assistant professor position at McGill University in 2018. Uh, she currently leads thermal energy laboratory lab, uh, which is focusing on heat transfer, specialized in solar thermal and advanced nuclear energy technologies. Uh, she recently completed uh, her master's and PhD degrees in nuclear science and engineering at MIT, specializing in thermal hydraulics in power technology. She's an expert in boiling heat transfer and molten salt power technologies. Uh, so she worked in United Arab Emirates on the development and construction of the CS Pant, uh, an innovative 25 kilowatt advanced molten salt solar receiver and thermal energy storage system. Uh, and we'll hear more about that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, Professor Tetra Friend is the recipient of graduate research scholarships from the National Science and en Engineering Research Council of Canada and the Fonds de Recherche du Québec Nature et Technologie. Uh, she also holds an advanced degree in music performance from Conservatoire de Musique de Montréal. Uh, so we are looking for uh, what your talks uh, and her talk is titled CS Pant Demonstration of a 25 kilowatt dispatchable solar power system. Okay, so do, do you have the video? You want me to, to play it? So actually, we prefer if you can give a live presentation, but otherwise we can also start the demo, uh, like presentation. Oh, oh okay. So I, I actually prepared the pre-recorded, so I'll just play that if that works. Okay, yeah, sure. So let me... We don't hear it. Oh, you don't hear it. Um, yeah, sorry, I thought it would... Uh, yeah, there is a volume like on the left hand side, maybe it's... You know, it's something. Oh, I have volume seems up. Um, so, uh, Manny, when you share that screen, uh, you, there's a, uh, basically you have to check uh, sort of, a, 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 I can't remember what it says, include the sounds in the video. So if you stop sharing and reshare, there's a button actually at the bottom to give you the option. That might be the reason. Got it. Hello everyone, thank you very much for tuning in to this presentation today. It's a pleasure to be speaking at this Applied Energy Symposium, so the virtual version. And today I'm gonna to be talking about the demonstration of a 25 kilowatt dispatchable solar power system called the CS Pond, or Concentrated Solar Power On Demand. So this was a, a very large collaborative project uh, between people really all over the world, but mainly researchers that were uh, at MIT and Khalifa University in Abu Dhabi. So the people listed here are just a few amongst a, a very large team of, of passionate people working on this project for several years. So if we look at the energy reserves here on Earth for both finite and renewable energy resources, the sun is, is really looking quite good in terms of, of energy available. So here you can see uh, this shows you the reserves in terawatt years and the little corresponding bubbles show the relative scale of each energy resource. So for both renewable and non-renewable -renew technologies or uh, energy resources. Now, despite having so much solar energy available, the problem with the sun is that first it's dilute. So we only have uh, one kilowatt per meter square and it's intermittent. So every energy resource is gonna have its, its trade-offs and this is the, the situation that we're dealing with uh, when it comes to solar energy. So this is where concentrated solar power comes in. So a lot of you are already familiar with concentrated solar power and some of you may not be. So it's a technology that has the potential to eliminate the problem of intermittency in renewable energy. 
So the way that it works is you have this big field of mirrors on the ground that concentrates natural sunlight hundreds to thousands of times and focuses it onto a receiver, which in this design is located at the top of a tower. So this is really the state of the art and concentrated solar power technology at the moment. So the receiver consists in arrays of tubes with a fluid circulating inside. So the natural sunlight can heat um, the tubes and then heat the fluid that circulates inside. So this can be a molten salt and can be heated to temperatures from 500 degrees C to 1000 degrees C. And it's then used as a heat source for, for power generation. So we can have a closer look at how this specific tower technology works um, in terms of power plant operations. So the salt exits a cold salt storage tank um, at 290 degrees C, and it's circulated to the top of a tower through the receiver where it's heated by this concentrated sunlight. It then circulates back down to a hot salt storage tank. So in this case, the hot salt storage tank is at 565 degrees C. And so here, as I mentioned, we're operating with molten salt. So then uh, it passes through a heat exchanger where it converts water into steam, which is then used to drive a steam turbine and produce electricity. So we can extract at a constant rate to produce electricity day and night, and the volume of salt in the cold and hot salt storage tank are going to vary. So if you're producing excess thermal energy, then the molten salt in the hot salt storage tank is going to be increasing. So this is the concept of thermal energy storage and is what allows concentrated solar power to eliminate intermittency in electricity production. So here you can see the, these two tank, the state of the art two tank thermal energy storage technology. So this is uh, of course sensible heat uh, thermal energy storage. And so it's very cheap and simple in comparison to battery technology and allows to dispatch our electricity 24 seven. Um, they also have, molten salts have a very large volumetric heat capacity, which is in fact similar to water, and it can therefore store a large amount of heat at very high temperature. Now, the levelized cost of electricity of CSP technology has been decreasing steadily every year for over a decade, as you can see here in this figure. So um, what we're seeing here is in 2010, this is the levelized cost of electricity, so 10 years ago for concentrating solar power. And then in 2019, we can see the cost uh, st has steadily decreased in 10 years approximately. And in fact, some, some record low costs down to six cents per kilowatt hour have also been reported. But nevertheless, nevertheless, CSP technology is still not really able to compete with fossil fuels. So this is where the range for fossil, fossil power or even photovoltaic technology for that matter. And the main reason is CSP plants are still a very large capital cost investment. And so they're really expensive to make. So if we look back at our state of the art solar tower technology, here we have the field of mirrors. So the, the heliostats are the most expensive components of the entire system. Now, the other problem with this technology is we have a receiver and storage technology, so these two tanks that require very high power uh, pumping powers in order to pump the salt at very high flow rates to the top of a tower and then um, to these two storage tanks. So in order to reduce these pumping requirements, which will in turn um, reduce the cost because we'll also need less heat tracing, we would ideally like to combine all three into a simple single unit. Now the other issue is that the max flux that can be tolerated by the receiver is limited by the tube material. So as you recall, this receiver is uh, consists in a bank of tubes and this concentrated solar radiation irradiates the tubes and then heats the heat transfer fluid. So an alternative is to absorb this concentrated solar radiation volumetrically directly into the working fluid itself. So it's a self-healing surface that can tolerate higher solar fluxes and solar flux variations. So this brings me to the CS Pond concept for concentrating solar power on demand. So in the CS Pond, we essentially have a three-in-one CSP concept with volumetric absorption that essentially eliminates all the issues that we have with this tower technology. So the way that it works is concentrated solar power is beamed directly into a big open tank of molten salt 
where it's absorbed, this, this concentrated solar radiation is absorbed volumetrically since the salt is semi-transparent to solar radiation. Now the tank is divided into two sections by a divider plate. So above the divider plate is the hot heated layer and below is the cold layer. And I have a little animation here that illustrates how the whole system works. So during the day, this concentrated solar power heats the hot layer and so that hot volume increases and during the night uh, we close the tank so we close the aperture and we continue to extract hot salt from the hot salt layer uh, except that this hot layer is now decreasing and the cold salt layer is increasing. So the CS bond concept was originally developed about 10 years ago at MIT which involved the concept development and some lab scale experimentation, so a small lab scale uh, CS bond pro prototype. So the idea was to have the single tank concept paired with a hillside mounted heliostats, which has a single reflection to the lid of the receiver. So that, that was phase one. So here you can see um, on the left the design of the phase one CS bond demo prototype. And on the right, you can see the hillside mounted heliostat optical design um, that was envisioned for, for the CS bond. So in phase two, um, this was in collaboration with the Mazdar Institute solar platform in Abu Dhabi, which is led by Dr. Nicola Calve, and it consisted in building a demonstration prototype of a 25 kilowatt CS pond system. So for the demonstration, we integrated the system with their existing beam down facility, but as I just mentioned, a CS pond would not be limited to this optical configuration um, since beam down technology tends to be a little less efficient in terms of optical efficiency. So the tank installed is 1.25 meters in diameter and two meters in height, and it's filled with sodium potassium binary nitrate salt, which you can see um, here on the right, which is a view, this is a view looking straight down into the tank of molten salt. So the tank is made of three millimeter thick 304L stainless steel, and it's insulated with two concentric layers of pyrogel and rock wool. So the tank is then instrumented with nine multi-junction K-type thermocouple rods of two meter in length, and they were sheathed in canal in order to avoid corrosion. So on the right is a top view of the tank, which shows the locations of these, these nine thermocouple rods. Now the divider plate consists of a 1.2 meter diameter by 30 millimeter thick welded 304L stainless steel shell and it has eight air chambers that are formed by seven radiation shielding discs. So you can see these discs in uh, this figure right here. So you can see the, the discs that form these radiation shields and you can also see the hoisting mechanism for the divider plate so you see the whole hoisting me mechanism here on the left. So the idea for the divider plate um, was for the shell to be airtight such that the poor thermal conductivity of air would insulate the hot layer from the cold layer. And, and then these internal discs would reduce radiative transfer from the top to the bottom of the divider plate. However, we did have some issues with salt penetrating um, inside the divider plate, which I'll talk about a little more later. Now throughout the design process, we were very concerned about developing hot spots because we knew very little about the thermal fluid behavior of the salts, um, how the volumetric heating would be distributed, and if enough natural convection would, would develop to mix the, the salt. So in order to promote mixing, a mixing plate was added in order to create active mixing in the heated layer. So you can see the mixing plate on the right here. This is our mixing plate and it's located above the divider plate and has its own hoisting mechanism. So it has these holes. Here you can see these holes and it allows the salt to flow through the holes as the, the mixing plate moves up and down. And the jets uh, that flow through the, the, that are formed and then promote mixing into the salt layer. Now finally the tank was mounted with a final optical element which is a 3D secondary concentrator to increase the final flux that's delivered to the tank and to reduce the, the thermal losses. So it consists of uh, an, a hexagonal cone with aluminum facets and it was removed at the end of each day and the tank aperture was closed at night in order to um, reduce thermal losses 
uh, during nighttime operation. So the design and construction of the prototype took several years, a lot of cooperation, coordinating a lot of weekly WebEx meetings for people at opposite sides of the globe. So at the time we had people in California and Boston and Abu Dhabi and, and I think in China and a lot of, there was a lot of sweating out in the desert was uh, uh, how this whole construction happened over, or over multiple years. So one of our colleagues actually made several videos of, of the whole construction process over the days and months as it occurred. And so here you can see um, this was over the course of a day assembling the, the top collar and the deck platform. So you can see the tank already and there they're installing the top collar. And now we see the deck platform. And now another video of installing the insulation and the temperature sensors. So I really like seeing the position of the sun change during the day in this accelerated video. So meanwhile, while all of this construction was going on, there were several lab experiments that were also going on in parallel to the design and construction of the prototype. So in particular, uh, we did a lot of experiments with respect to the salt properties. So we focused both on the uh, optical properties of the salts and the thermophysical properties of the salt. So here you can see this is a custom setup that we we developed from measuring salt, uh, for measuring these the salt's optical properties. So one key finding that we found was that um, although the salts are used in existing power plants up to 565 degrees C, when they're heated in these open atmospheric conditions, they actually start to decompose at a lower temperature and they become cloudy and lose all of their volumetric absorption properties. So here you can see um, in this top image on um, this top image here, we have the regular binary nitrate. So this is a commercial salt uh, provided by SQM at 400 degrees C. And then below it is what we see when we decompose the salt. So when we overheat it to 550 degrees C uh, for 30 minutes, it becomes this kind of cloudy, uh, this cloudy color. So the thermophysical properties don't change that much at this temperature, but the optical properties do change significantly and it significantly changes the volumetric absorption. So this indicated to us that we couldn't go to very high temperatures or as high as we would have liked to. Um, and then the last salt that we also looked at were these binary chlorides of sodium potassium chloride because these are salts that we're um, looking to for ne the next iteration, the next phase of the CS pond. Now we also looked at the effects of adding sand to the salt since this is an open tank operated out in the desert. So we got a lot of questions over the years about sand uh, entering the tank and, and getting into the salt. So the effect of these impurities on the thermophysical properties uh, and mainly melting and crystallization points, thermal stability and um, specific heat. So these effects were actually found to be, to be pretty insignificant when we added sand. So the effects of these impurities on the optical prep properties was also measured experimentally in the lab in the same setup. And what happened was that although the sand does have an effect on the optical properties in the short term, um, it was actually found that the sand settles over time as shown in the figure below. So here we melted some salt in a crucible, added some sand and just let it sit there for a little while in the furnace. And we could clearly see that the sand just settled to the bottom and it had what remained suspended in the salt had a very negligible impact on the overall optical properties. Now, that being said, over time, it's possible that the tank will have too much sand settling at the bottom and it will make operation a little more difficult. So 
Eventually, it may be necessary to add some sort of fibrous metal filter to remove the excess solid particulates from the salt. So here you can see the salt loading and melting process. So roughly 3.8 tons of commercial salt uh, were provided by SQM and were added to the tank, as you can see here. So we did have some issues in the loading process because the salt spent a significant amount of time in storage. And um, because Abu Dhabi is in fact very hot and also humid and not dry at all in the summer. So the salt had caked into very large blocks. So the entire melting process, once we got everything um, uh, mixed and eventually made a powder out of, out of this giant caked block, um, the entire melting took approximately four days to complete and it was done primarily with solar energy, so 80% solar energy, and then this was assisted by some electrical resistance heaters. So, so overall it was estimated only 20% of the energy used to melt the salts came from external resistance heaters. So in order to accomplish this melting process, um, what we did is we added each day, we added more salts to the, to the tank. So we added some salts, melted it with some solar energy, and then the next day we added more salts, melted with more solar energy, and so on until four days later, everything was, was melted. So this was quite remarkable considering how reflective um, the salt appears to visible light. In fact, we did not do any optical experiments um, on the frozen salt, only on molten salts. So we did also look into accelerating, into methods for accelerating the, me the melting process, such as, for example, sprinkling highly solar absorbing slags at the, the surface of the salt, which would eventually sink at the bottom um, of the tank once the salt had been, was melted. But we didn't actually need to use them here since we had these resistance heaters, but it is something that we can look into in the future if um, we really wanted to achieve this without any resistance heaters at all. So overall, really, this was a huge success since it was the first time ever that anyone had melted salts exclusive or almost exclusively with solar radiation. And in fact, so traditional salt melting processes actually require fossil fuel fired melters in order to melt the salt. So this is a lot greener and simpler process since everything is done integral in the actual system. Okay, so now on to the experimental results, which is of course the most exciting part. So here you can see the temperature profile in the molten salt for a charge between 350 degrees C and 475 degrees C on June 22nd. So June 22nd is when this experiment was carried out. So here uh, you can see on, uh, I have temperature versus time of day. So the objective of this experiment was to gradually heat the hot salt layer at a uniform constant temperature of approximately 450 degrees C. So in this case, each curve corresponds to the average temperature at different depths as a function of time. So you can see here, um, Curve one, so this is, is located at the bottom. So this green curve is located at the bottom of the tank. So it corresponds to this location here. And curve 12 corresponds to this location right below the surface of the salt. So located right here. And so the, the height of the divider plate is progressively lowered throughout the day to control the temperature of the hot salt layer as we continue to absorb solar radiation. So once the divider plate and mixing plate reached their lowest position, which was at 1.10 p.m., the surface temperature was above the set point. Um, so you can see here the surface temperature was slightly above the set point, which was 450 degrees C, as, as you remember. So the mixing plate was then uh, moved rapidly through one up-down stroke at 1.12 p.m. And this very rapidly homogenized the temperature distribution. And we can also see one other phenomenon that we notice from, from these curves is that we can also see the thermocouples located below the divider plate um, that are starting to heat up. So we can see these lower curves. So this curve one, two, um, three, we, we start seeing them also increase in temperature, indicating that there is some conduction to the bottom layer. So here is again, uh, for the same experiment on June 22nd, we can see this, this dashed line here 
um, this dashed line corresponds to the divider plate position at the start of the experiment at 8 a.m. So during the day, as we progressively heat the salt uh, above the divider plate, so this dashed line um, corresponds to the top of the divider plate, um, moves down and it allows more salt to become exposed for solar heating until, um, until the, the divider plate reaches its lower position at 1.10 p.m. So we can see this curve is not entirely uniform at 1.10 p.m. So we can see this uh, curve is kind of, um, we don't have a completely uniform temperature in our salt as we were hoping for. And in fact, this non-uniformity is worsened by the fact that the mixing plate is blocking some solar radiation from reaching the divider plate. So after the mixing stroke, so after the mixing stroke, we now have this temperature distribution here, so it's much more uniform until the end of the experiment. So we can also see once again that the bottom layer is being heated by conduction because we can see these temperatures are also increasing throughout the day. Now this figure shows the cumulative energy stored in the salt mass over time. So this was estimated using the average temperature at each height in the salt. So we have energy in kilowatt hours versus time of day. So this trend is as we, we would actually expect even before and after the homogenization with the mixing plate. So here we can see here um, is where the single mixing, uh, mixing plate stroke occurs and the energy still continues to follow a continuous um, trend in time. Finally, the last experiment that was done was this um, experiment that we call the uniform charging mode. So when the system is to be used to generate electricity only after sunset, the temperature of the hot layer no longer needs to be maintained constant while it's charging. So the receiver losses due to the exposed hot surface can be reduced by charging the entire volume from a colder state to a hotter state, rather than trying to keep the hot, the hot layer at some set point throughout. So even with no mixing plate motion, the gradient of temperature and the useful volume of salt is less than 10 Kelvin per, per meter. So you can see here I have, once again, temperature versus time of day. And actually in this uniform charging mode, all of these curves, so from all of these points from eight to 12, they, they all almost overlap. And so the temperature is, is very uniform in this in, this, um, in these experimental conditions. So this actually suggests that natural convection was substantial enough in this case to maintain the salt at a relatively uniform temperature. And if the system is designed and operated appropriately, the mixing plate may not be needed. So some general conclusions and takeaways. Um, the CS pond allows us to reduce the need of heat tracing that, we, that is typically required for tower and receiver piping. Um, and this is because we now have this nice, simple three-in-one system. There's no need for high pressure pumps for cold salt transport to the tower receiver, very low parasitic energy consumption. The initial melting didn't require any fossil fuels, so we only needed uh, solar radiation and a little bit of help from our, our resistance heaters, and it was accomplished in four days. There's no need to drain the solar receiver at the end of each day of operation. And we have a reduced susceptibility to thermal shock because the solar radiation is now absorbed volumetrically. So when we have um, variation throughout the day due to focusing and defocusing or when clouds pass, um, it's much less susceptible to shock because it's being absorbed over volume instead. Now, some lessons learned and some future work. So there were things, of course, that worked and things that didn't work so as well as we had planned. So in particular, if I look at, for example, the divider plate, um, the pros were it effectively blo blocks solar radiation from, cold, from the, the cold bottom layer. The cons is it was not uh, as effective as we had hoped at thermally insulating each layer. So that was one big issue that we had with this divider plate and the motion is also manually controlled, meaning we do have this hoisting mechanism, but we need some user to actually control its position throughout the day, depending on what temperature reading we have. So some future work would be to improve the thermal design and to improve the automatic control of the divider plate. 
Now moving on to the mixing plate. So the mixing plate did a really good job at uh, providing some additional redundant mixing. However, it did block the solar radiation from penetrating to the divider plate. It was not as essential as we initially expected. Uh, so if we design the receiver and uh, such that we promote passive mixing due to natural convection, um, we should be able to get away with it uh, without it. And finally, the, this active mixing mechanism, so we have more hoisting mechanisms and, and all of this active mixing is an additional possible failure mode in the receiver. So it is um, something to consider. So future work involves implementing passive mixing inside the receiver. So how do we actually get this passive mixing? And as I said earlier on, I mentioned that um, the reason why we put the mixing plate in the first place was because we, we had a very poor understanding of the overall thermal fluid behavior. So that has changed in, in all the years since um, starting this project, uh, we did gain some insight in the thermal fluid uh, behavior inside the receiver. And so by doing some CFD and some theoretical analysis, we now have some models to actually predict the temperature distribution in the receiver as a function of time and to actually predict what conditions give uh, certain uh, conditions that are favorable for natural con convection. Now, one of the, the very important points to address here are the thermal losses, because as we know, we have this big tank of open molten salt that's open to the atmosphere. And so we do have thermal losses from this exposed salt surface at high temperature. And so, of course, the, the advantage of having this big open tank is that we enable direct volumetric absorption. But the downsides are that we have thermal losses and also it's open to dust and sand from the surrounding environment. So future work involves integrating a solar transparent cover. So we did work on this in the lab and we developed, we developed an insulating cover for this direct absorption molten salt receiver. So it's solar transparent and it reduces thermal losses up to 50%. So it consists of these hollow quartz uh, spheres that are floating around on the surface of the salt. And so the remaining work is to just uh, actually deploy it in the prototype and test it under a solar, real solar conditions and not just in the lab. Now we talked about the, the thermal losses, so thermal efficiency, but there's also the optical efficiency. So we can improve the geometry of the aperture, but most importantly, um, we can deploy the concept in some alternate, more efficient solar field and receiver configurations. So as I said, this was all uh, tested and demonstrated in a beam down facility, um, which has uh, two reflections. But we, this, the CS point concept was actually developed with uh, hillside mounted heliostats in mind. So that would eliminate one additional reflection, which, which would reduce the optical losses. And some final lessons learned, well, and future work, well, we also have continued prototype operation to assess the reliability and obtain some long-term data. We need some, some more materials testing, and we need to operate at higher temperatures. So this is something we're looking at for the future, is to operate with chlorides, chloride salts, which are much higher temperature and would allow us to operate at, in using gas power cycles instead. So some acknowledgments, as I mentioned earlier on, this was a, a huge team. And I want to thank everybody who worked on this project with me. Questions? Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. And I have a personal interest on CSP. I did my PhD on uh, concentrated solar power for uh, like hydrogen production and co-power generation. So it's really uh, great to see that CS Pond has moved to uh, new stages. Uh, so I'll start with a question from our attendees. Uh, so this is a uh, question from Kina Trova, uh, who is a PhD candidate in McGill University. And uh, so the question is, if there is, uh, that if there was a, a freezing event and the salt solidified, do you believe that concentrated solar would be enough to remelt the salts? If so, this would be a tremendous advantage over CSP tower mounts. Um, so, uh, in fact, yes. So the advantage of uh, molten salts is that the first melt is always the most difficult. Um, so it always has. So you have you start with a uh, two separate salts. So we use 
uh, a mixture of potassium and sodium nitrate salts. And before they reach that uh, mix, eutectic mixture, um, the, melting, the melting point is much higher. So you always have to overshoot. And then once it freezes and you melt again, um, yes, we, we did remelt it actually uh, with a concentrating solar power. And when it's sold, how long does it take to remelt? Um, it takes less time, so about a day instead of four days. Okay. In that time, your operation stops. Yes, exactly. Uh, we have a question from Professor Lee. Uh, is there an estimate of rate of salt mass loss due to vapor pressure? It's actually quite low. I don't have the numbers, but the mass loss is actually not that high. Um, we didn't quantify it, but in terms of the fraction, so we, we did calculate, estimate the, the thermal losses, including losses due to evaporation, and it was about 1% of the total losses. So it's actually quite low. So I have several questions, starting with, actually, I think the design is amazing and it can be used for many different applications as well. But uh, so the way I see it, it really brings down the scale that you need for CSP operations. So you can really build a small scale CSP. So uh, what is the missing piece here? So why we are not seeing this like uh, installed? Uh, when do you think it will be in a commercial uh, development phase? And finally, I want to ask about the cost. Uh, so you said that this will bring down the cost. Do you have any estimate about the cost? Yeah, okay, so first question was uh, why, okay, so why haven't we deployed this yet? So we think we need one more stage before we can actually reach commercialization. So uh, we did, first stage was a lab scale prototype. Second stage was to actually test it out in the desert and actually melt the salt using real concentrated sunlight. And um, we only did, this project was just huge and just building it. Um, we didn't do a lot of long-term operation experiments. So what would happen uh, long-term going through this, these different thermal cyclings and whatnot. So that's um, the last stage and connecting it to a, a lab scale steam, steam generator. So those are really the, the last stages before we can actually deploy it. Mm -hmm. And then the second question is cost. So um, we did do a cost estimate for the levelized cost of electricity about um, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And on the most uh, optimistic side, we had about seven cents um, per kilowatt hour. Most pessimistic was uh, closer to uh, 25 cents per kilowatt hour. So still not competitive, but that was 10 years ago. And then since then, there's been a lot of um, improvement in the optics of concentrating solar power. So we really need to go back and revise those numbers because the, it's probably much lower and much more competitive now with um, fossil power and other alternate uh, modes of energy. So your title was like dispatchable power. So how dispatchable it is and how much of a flexibility we can get? Because at the end of the day, you are still using a steam turbine at the bank. So can you uh, operate at like part load? How uh, fast it's to start the process? To start the process? Um like startup, I, I guess it's not something that you would really want to start up. It's not as, uh, as difficult as a nuclear reactor for startup, um, but it is, uh, it's not the same as firing uh, a fossil fuel plant. Mm -hmm. So definitely on the order, I would say of a day at this point, but it's something that we can look into reducing. And moving forward, the plan is still keeping the same temperature levels and operating with a steam turbine, or do you think there will be another like power generation unit on the back end? More efficient? Yeah, um, well, mold, yeah, as a lot of people are doing a lot of work with higher temperature molten salts, where we collaborated a lot with the nuclear uh, people in nuclear engineering. I, I worked on this while I was in nuclear engineering. And so we're getting a lot of inspiration from materials that are being developed um, for chloride salts, for example. So if we're able to use chloride salts, um, we would ideally actually like to run a supercritical CO2 cycle so we can get higher efficiencies, higher cycle efficiencies. 
Thank you very much. Uh, so we are on time. Uh, it was very interesting talk. Uh, and now 